They called up the attorney and they said to the attorney, now this is what you're going to be getting in the mail, probably certified. Do not accept that package. Return it. Why? Yes, see what he would do. Right? Now, let me ask you a question. Where are the originals for the filing? No, they're not in the clerk of courts. They're in that package. If nobody accepts and receives that package, who has a duty to do anything? Nobody. So the public court sits there, dumb, stupid, and happy. They've got no notice of anything publicly from anyone. And the only, only the party that has the originals with the draft to file has a duty, right? And he isn't picking them up in the mail, right? Now, is that a dishonor? Why do you assume that? Could anybody tell me in this room, under any circumstances or conditions, where it wouldn't be a dishonor to refuse it? Let's assume he's dead. Would it go back and not be a dishonor? Absolutely. So we got one example now. Why do you assume and presume just because it came back to him it was a dishonor? You fell into Victoria's trap. You did not understand any other circumstances. What happens if the attorney honestly believes he has no legal duty to that client? Yeah, like I was discharged and dismissed from that. I don't have to receive papers from him and creating a duty on me that I don't have anymore. So, Joe, don't get upset with the attorney. Certainly, he probably should have taken his mail and opened it and said, oh, gee, well, now i got to decide whether I'm going to do this or not. See, the judge or somebody called him up and said, don't you dare take that envelope. Just cause it to go back and we will see what happens. Right? Okay. So now it came back. Well, here's our friend Larry. Oh, gee, I don't know whether I ought to pick up the mail or not. Duh! If he don't pick up the mail, what's that? Another dishonor, because here is important documents and papers trying to settle the case, and he decided to run and hide instead of go settle the case. He's dishonoring his own dis process. Okay? Hello, he's a double-minded man, a lunatic. I guess that ends that so much for an experiment in attempted honor. <laughs> so I said, pick up the documents. Now, what are you going to have him do with those documents now that he's got them? Resend them to who? No, the attorney will just send them back again. Take them to the clerk of court? What, you want him to operate like he's a officer of the court? <laughs> Duh! <laughs> what was that? Prosecutor? What about the prosecutor? He got the private one as a witness. What do you want to do with the prosecutor? He's the only officer of the court you know anymore because the other one won't take your process. So, write a new letter rogatory to the prosecutor of the court. Say, attached here, unopened, with authority for you to open it and execute it, or pass the unopened package on to the new counsel representing the undersigned, is the documentation that was dishonored by the PD. Please be advised that I am requesting that you as an officer of the court, since you have to make sure... Isn't it the prosecutor's duty to make sure all the officers of the court are in position for a prosecution? Yeah. Well, what officer doesn't exist in the court right now? Yeah. Defense counsel. Please hand this off to the defense counsel. Be he a new one, old one, middle-aged one, whatever the hell he is. 
or else I authorize you as a counsel for the court, assisting either side and or both sides, open the package and cause the appropriate documents to be publicly filed. Hello? Now I said, this time, when you send the original to the prosecutor, you're going to send a copy to the public defender, but send his just by regular mail this time, so he'll open it. And send a copy to the clerk and the judge, but don't send those for about three days <laughs> after you send the one to the prosecutor, so nobody has a heads up of what's coming. No, yeah, wait till the green card comes back. So I said, are we having any fun yet? Oh man, I'm not going to go to jail for this one, am I? <laughs> man, all you're trying to do is just help the court settle this case, okay? So I, I just wanted to show you that if you don't think using public attorneys for private purpose isn't the way to go, these people are doing everything they can in the book to pull out the stops that you don't try to do that and put them in that position unless you're honorable and you really know what you're doing. Okay, now I've got another out-of-state guy, Dennis. And he has been doing this to the attorney in a criminal case. And his attorney is supposed to be, quote, one of the best criminal attorneys in that whole state. When this criminal attorney goes to court for a client, other attorneys in that state just go to court to see what that guy does. That's how good this guy is, okay? Now, Dennis put this guy under a draft to be on the private side. And this attorney is moaning and groaning and doing whatever, and he keeps sending private letters back to Dennis now telling Dennis what the prosecution is. They're going to get on your case looking at this. The judge is going to do this. Everybody's going to do that. What are you, crazy? But his attorney, by his private letters, is giving him a heads up as to what he has to be aware of. So this attorney is really pretty cool, okay? Now, the attorney came out about four weeks ago and put a motion into the court to be dismissed from the case just because it seemed like there were differences of opinion with his client. Now, today was the hearing date on that motion. And so Dennis kept saying to begin with, gee, should I go to the hearing? I said, oh, always go to the hearings. You're an aggrieved party. You're a third party. You're interested in knowing what's going on in the court. You're trying to help the court resolve this issue. You would never not want to go to a hearing. Please go to the hearing. Well, if I go, what do you think they're going to do? Well, I think they're going to solicit you because you're the most important person there. You're trying to settle a case. And they're going to ask you a whole sh uh, shaboom bunch of questions to try to see what the heck you're doing and test you to see if you're off in left field or if you really know what you're doing. Oh, well, and if I go to the hearing, they're probably going to interrogate me. That's exactly right. So have your ducks. In a row, have your I's dotted, your T's crossed, go through some practice with your friends, do questions that you might expect and questions that you might not even expect to have at the hearing, so you're practiced. So he said, okay. So he called me up yesterday, even, got, and I guess it was Saturday, got some information. Yep, he's all primed. Called me this morning before he went to the hearing, just the last minute like pep talk. I said, hey, no problem, you're going to handle it well. And basically, he had the affidavit of negative averment that I don't think the attorney has ever had anything dishonorable to do. I think that we've always been in honor. I have never dishonored the attorney. He's never dishonored me. I don't understand why he wants to step down. I don't understand what the court's going to do for counsel for the defendant if they relieve the defense counsel, but that's the court's problem. All of neat stuff. So he goes in today... And he calls me after the hearing, and he goes, wow, that was different. I'm going, gee, what they do? I said, but the good news is, you're not in jail, you're still out, and everything else. He says, yep, no problemo. I said, well, what was strange about it? He said, well, the attorney that moved the court to be dismissed wasn't there. I go, whoa, that's interesting. 
And he said, and the judge held this hearing and asked me questions and it had nothing to do with the dismissal of the attorney. It wasn't on that motion. I go, well, that makes sense. They'll always shock and surprise you to get you totally off balance to see what you're going to do to create a dishonor. Now, why should they hold a hearing on the motion to dismiss the attorney? Wasn't all his negative averments perfect? Did the court have a reason to excuse the attorney? No, there were no dishonors. So the court had to think up something to use the opportunity for a hearing. What was the court listening to? It was listening to a motion. Who brought the motion? The attorney that moved to be dismissed brought a motion. What was the motion that the attorney who had also moved to be dismissed, what did he bring before the court that they heard today? Well, our hero, Dennis, has been complaining for two years while this case has been going on that when the case started, the law enforcement officials raided his house and took his computer, some software, and some other gadgets. And he keeps bitching, when are you going to return my property? So, a couple of weeks ago, his attorney said, gee, you never got your property back, did you? No, I didn't. The attorney put in a motion for return of his computer and property. And that's the motion the court heard today. And so when I went in there, the judge says to the prosecutor, it looks like we've got some property that hasn't been returned. And the prosecutor's going, yeah, and we got to hold that in case there's an appeal. And you know, that property is evidence and all this kind of stuff. And then the judge asked our hero Dennis. Now I said, oh my God, <laughs> I see long stays in a lonely jail cell for you in the future in my crystal ball. What did you do? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, let me ask you a question. What is the value of all that property? I mean, if, if the state sold it today at a forced sale, how much money would they get for all of that property? Well, it was worth $1,500 a couple of years ago, new as a computer. I said, well, they'd be lucky to get a couple hundred dollars out of that computer today. I said, is there any personal information on that computer that you ain't got, like pictures of a family or something you could never, ever, ever live without? He said, absolutely not. He says, there's nothing on it. So all they got is the box. They didn't even take the monitor or anything else. I said, what is $1,500 worth to you compared to about 50 years in prison in your life. He says, well, it doesn't mean a thing. It's just, it's been bugging me. I said, how many times have we told you, you're trying to settle this case with your exemption for closure, aren't you? He says, yes. I said, before they can reach your exemption, what have they got to exhaust and go through? Your assets, which are really liability. I said, you didn't seriously argue that that computer was yours and you wanted it back, did you? Because it didn't belong to you. It belongs to the straw man, if anything. And this whole thing is another test to see if you want to come in and argue about the straw man's possessions, which makes you a defense counsel pro se. Since the lawyer ain't there. He said, well then I think I done well. Because the judge just kind of said when I didn't say hardly anything that the judge said that he's denying the motion as being premature. I said, I think you probably escaped that one then. You see the levels of the tests they will put you through to see who you are arguing for whether you're the defense counsel, whether you're just a third party, a grief party, if you can't give up your property, you can't save your property. So our friend Dennis has learned the hard way to expect anything, and here's an attorney that moved the court for dismissal and he didn't even show up for the so-called motion hearing because it was won privately before 
the court hearing ever even took place publicly to decide it, yay or nay. Talking to Nick. <coughs> Is your name Caleb? Caleb? It could be. I'm asking you a question. The judge wants to know. Is this your name, Caleb? Wrong. Beep. It has, I know you're asking, who is it referring to me, the human being or the straw man? Caleb, we hope that you will learn one more thing tonight. The name doesn't belong to the human being. Had that talk with you. Didn't have that talk with him, Caleb. Okay. At baptism, what do they do? They sprinkle you with champagne. They christen you and give you a name. Just like they do a vessel on the high sea. I christen you the SS Caleb. And then they sprinkle champagne on you. And now they have just named the fiction. Were you given a name by the Creator? Scripture says, I have known you since you were conceived. The living man is known as Caleb. Caleb is not his name. Caleb is the name of the straw man fiction. Living people have no name. If you're operating in your living capacity, you have no name. If you're operating in commerce through your fiction, that is your name. When the judge says, is this your name? Answer is no. I am known as Caleb. That is not my name. Only fictions and vessels on the high seas are given names. Don't they call it a given name? You can be known by something, but it's not your name. Isn't that name registered in the corporate church? Isn't that name registered in the documentation of the one world government for birth? B-E-R-T-H. So now you know that everything in the corporate church is nothing more than the christening of the vessel and the giving of the, the commercial name, which is why the state will accept that name from the, from the baptismal ceremony. Okay? That's probably a pretty good place to stop tonight. Next week I'm going to go into some pretty incredible stuff. For instance, I don't think we ought to be writing checks out of closed accounts at all. Period. And I will tell you why next week. Lord willing, we'll see you then. Thank you.